So, one of the major hurdles, one of the last major hurdles to get this thing all registered with the engine is actually the brake booster. So, I put the brake booster on the left in when I first uh, started doing the swap. Got it from you pull it for 30 bucks from some old derelict Porsche. And seemed like a good thing at the time. And uh, I don't have any regrets about it for the price. The only problem I've got is that under emergency type braking or what would be track level braking, uh, it's got a weird bit of free play and then it's got uh, no boost at all. And it basically means that you're uh, pulling up the car with no assistance and although I can get the wheels to lock, it's not comfortable, it requires a ridiculous amount of force to do and uh, I'm definitely not going to pass Regency. Also, I want my girlfriend or anyone else to be able to drive this car without issue and uh, having brakes like that isn't going to cut it. So, I've got the brake booster on the right, mainly because it's a bit bigger and I think the one on the left here that I've been using is just too small and can't provide the uh, assistance needed. So, I got this one from eBay. It's brand new. I don't know what it's from. I suspect it might be a 944 booster. I tried to get them in Australia, but I didn't have any luck, but maybe in the US they can or if they know someone. So uh, yeah, that's a new booster. This one's been modified to apparently be uh, just a bolt-in option with no other modifications needed. So we'll see if that's the case. I got it from a guy whose username is fungus underscore zero. Bit of an odd username to be selling brake boosters through, but uh, I guess you gotta have a username. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna put this in the car. Hopefully, you can see the size difference there. Hopefully nothing's gonna hit in particular the, uh, the intake manifold. I imagine it probably shouldn't, but I might need to grind down those fins that are on there. Otherwise, uh, yeah, chuck this in the car and see how it goes. Also, this guy has been making so much noise while I've been trying to shoot this. Mate, quiet on set. No, doesn't listen. Anyway, let's do it. Oi, do you have to eat everything? Anyway, those two fins there had to be cut down. I uh, did that with the Dremel, otherwise it wasn't going to fit in. And when I cut it down only a little bit, it fit physically, but there wasn't enough room for the engine to have that little bit of movement. So those two fins there at the end, I've uh, got rid of them basically. So it should fit in nice and easy now, even though it is pretty tight around it compared to the other one. But... Shouldn't have any issues as far as I can see. No. As you can see, the new brake booster is in there now. And uh, I've been driving with it for a couple of days. It works. There's really not too much to, more to say about it. it. Works like a standard car should. It has enough pedal pressure um, under the highest amount of brakes. Uh, I tested it, locked up the fronts a couple of times and yeah, well, it really wasn't that hard to uh, to do. I'm quite happy with the amount of boost that it provides. It doesn't feel any different than this car felt when it was standard. Uh, no weird feeling through the pedal anymore. Everything bolted in with the exception of just uh, trimming down those fins on the intake manifold. All the lines um, went into the, uh, the brake master cylinder and all the brake master cylinder connected to it. On the firewall side, uh, that all bolted into the standard bracket tree, uh, or the standard holes in the firewall. The standard uh, adjuster went on there um, with no real issues. So uh, yeah, no complaints. It does what it needs to do, and it obviously allows enough room for the engine. So For a couple of months now, I've had this crappy bracket from Super Cheap holding up the pod filter and the uh, airflow meter. So I decided it was time to uh, build something that looks a bit nicer and holds everything a bit better. Um, as you can tell, that's got a bit of flex in it. So I have built this. And uh, the reason I did this is partly because I needed something to do those functions and also because I now have a welder and I am used it enough that I wanted to try something that I was going to put onto the car. So uh, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. Basically, that's... Uh, the standard E30 uh, airbox mounting points there. So off that I put a bit of flat bar and uh, welded in two studs. Then I folded up a, a little bit of metal into a triangle 
and welded it, or originally tacked with it in the car, and then welded that on. And uh, that triangle just has the hose clamp go through it, and it holds it nice and sturdy. The only bit of flex is actually in the original uh, E30 airbox mounts, which is probably a good amount of flex considering you know the engine moves and bits and pieces. So I'm pretty happy with it. It fits in with the theme of black, and I think it looks reasonably good. Don't know how it'll go over inspection. Don't know if they'll like, not the bracket itself, but the actual uh, having a pod filter, but we'll figure that out when it comes to it. I don't want to build an airbox just in case they're unhappy with it. I'd rather just run the risk, and if they say I have to, I will. Um, it's a big job. You can't just put the original M41 back on there. So uh, if it is, it's not a way that I'm, I've figured out yet, so... Yep, yeah, that's all done. Another thing done, and I'm pretty happy with how the engine bay's turned out. It's looking pretty good at the moment. Nice and not perfectly standard, but standard-esque, I guess. So, uh, yeah, very happy. Electrically, I've had the uh, wiring that goes from the battery terminal to the car sort of looped up around the strut tower here. And uh, it's been annoying me for a while. I finally did something about it. And here's what I've done. You can see I've uh, basically shortened these wires the E36 loom is actually longer than you need, thankfully, at least with the application of having the battery up the front. So, shorten them up. I uh, use cable lugs and a bit of heat shrink. The two smaller top cable lugs, I had a uh, ratchet set with the right, uh, ratchet crimpers with the right jaws. And the bottom one there, I had to borrow from work a big, sort of heavy duty style battery cable lug uh, crimper. But uh, all worked pretty well. That big wire there, it sort of had this weird join and had a wire, another power wire coming off it. Um, but I didn't really need that extra power wire, so I cut it just before the connection and crimped it on there. So if you have the car and you've got the loom and you're wondering what that extra wire does, I don't know, but I got rid of it and it's all good. So uh, yeah, nice, neat and tidy and just a single bolt to, uh, to get them all off. So I've been driving the car for about uh, six months now, but one of the luxuries that I haven't had is uh, a heater. I originally got a, the, uh, the pipe that comes through the firewall modified to make that all work, but the actual valve that sits in around under the dash, I noticed when I put it together was leaking. You can see the valve just there. Um, so that was leaking a bit of water and I didn't want to put it back in the car like that So at the time I just bypassed the heater completely so I could drive the car um, So what I've done since is I've actually fixed the uh, the valve there Using an o-ring. I've done a separate video on that because it's not specific to the uh, m52. It's more of an e30 in general um, Video so I've uh, if you want to check that out. There's another video. I think it's the last video to this one on the uh, the e30 uh, playlist I guess you'd call it and uh, so if you want to check that out feel free but uh, so that's all fixed up doesn't leak now I've got this all back in there the way it should be uh, no leaks I've already run the car and checked the uh, the heater works it's nice and warm so uh, that's all done so in regards to the hoses that I used to uh, plumb this all up basically the uh, the hose that goes from the back of the M52 head to the bottom outlet there is just the uh, standard M20 unit. Um, basically is the same sort of thing as the uh, M20, so, and it also has the same outlet sizes. So that hose is basically, you can just buy it and look it up on real OEM and then buy it from a dealer and uh, that should fit straight on. The top hose here though, that goes from the, uh, the top outlet on the firewall through to the metal pipe, that hose is something that I've created more custom. So basically what I've got here is from the metal pipe um, to a joiner is the standard M52 pipe. And then from the joiner, and I think you can probably see it here, so you've got the outlet here, and then it swoops down and you can see the joiner there. So the top bit here, is basically just a hose that I went to Repco, a parts dealer here in Australia, and I looked until I found something that had the right curvature to it, and that would work around the other hose at the bottom there, because you obviously need them to uh, to work with each other, because it's pretty, pretty
pretty tight. So you can see the joiner down there where uh, the M52 hose comes from the bottom, the, the pipe under the manifold. Then there's a joiner and I think that one was from like a Statesman, like a uh, V8 Statesman, but I'm not sure exactly which one. It really didn't have it, half the sticker had been ripped off it, so I can't really help you on that one, but probably what I would do if I was you, just uh, get the pipe, go down to your local parts store and go through the, the hose bin and see if you can find something that's gonna work. And yeah, I just used a, a, brass, a brass connector down there Obviously you'd rather not have more connections like that in the system because it can create more leaks, but sometimes you don't really have an option because there's not going to be a custom, or there's not going to be a hose that's going to suit your custom application. So that's, uh, that's how I plumbed it all up. One thing to keep in mind with the piping on this side though is that the top pipe that comes through the firewall there, I've actually modified that. So I did that a while ago when I originally went to, uh, to make all the heater work when I first put the engine in. So just keep that in mind. I actually made it shorter and I also uh, cut it at the, near the end and put it so that it comes out at a slightly different angle. Also, it wouldn't get as close to the end of the uh, inlet manifold there. So. Yesterday I went through and got through the final stage of getting the M52 all certified and compiled in my car. And I thought I might just quickly go through some of the bits and pieces that I had to do to get that to happen. Probably going to be, this part of the video is going to be a bit more um, applicable to those in South Australia. Um, but I think for other states and other countries there might be bits and pieces that you can take from it. Um, but you might have to apply them in different ways because South Australia does their vehicle modi modifications one way and New South Wales will do it another and you know if you're in a different country it's going to be the same thing again. But I think generally speaking they're going to take a lot of the same sort of things into consideration. Uh, so first thing that I had to do when I wanted to get this all certified and compiled and legal was uh, South Australia has a, a form that you fill out um, which is an application to modify. So basically what you do is you put some basic details of the modifications that you're going to doing, do on their um, form and then you write a document, I wrote a Word document, explaining um, the swap and then various aspects of the swap. And they sort of point out to you, I think it's either five or six points, I'll put them down in the corner here somewhere, um, that you have to cover off on um, that they're wanting to have some information about I think it's something like um, acceleration, brakes, handling, uh, emissions, and something else. Um, so basically I went through and with brakes, I told them that um, this is a series two, so it's got disc brakes front and rear, um, very similar to the six cylinder, I think. I think the only difference is maybe slotted rotors, something along those lines. Um, so I told them it's got discs all around, brakes that are the same or very similar as the, uh, the 2.5 litres six cylinders. Um, and that the M52 being an alloy block is going to be the same weight or um, slightly lighter than the, M50, uh, than the um, M20. There's probably some conjecture there whether it is or isn't. Um, I've heard arguments for both but in the end I said alloy block going to be lighter than an iron block um, sounds very believable um, so I wrote that there and said basically for the brakes um, you can only do 110 in South Australia so you shouldn't be traveling faster than 110 M40 can do 110 so uh, I said the car should stop um, in the same manner and the same uh, distance as the 325i um, in standard form, so there shouldn't be any reason that brakes would be an issue in this modification. Um, then I went through the emissions and I said, well, um, this is a newer engine from a newer car, um, so it's going to have the same or better emissions regulations. Um, so I said I'd use um, the standard catalytic converter, which I didn't end up using because when I rang the emissions testing place, they said, no, 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 don't do that. That cat's old. It'll be shit. Put a brand new one in it. I think I went for Euro 4 or 5. But basically I said, um, 
this engine will pass emissions as per the original car E36 did. So I covered off on that. Acceleration and engine size wise, these came out with a 2.7, so it's only 100 cc's bigger, even though it was the economy one that was slow as shit, but anyway. And I also said that the M3, I think it was phase three or version three, the last one, um, had significantly more power than this. So power and you know cc capacity shouldn't really be an issue. Um, and then I went through each of those aspects and, and spoke about them, spoke about why they wouldn't be an issue. I spoke about the things that need to be done in the swap. Um, I said about using BMW uh, engine mounts, uh, that the original trans, uh, that the original gearbox will bolt straight up to that, and that I should be able to use standard parts throughout um, from the gearbox back, which I didn't quite do, but I could have done um, just because I couldn't get those parts. Um, not because they don't work, but 320i parts, I believe, work with the, the G240. Um, but I couldn't, everyone wants those parts, so I couldn't get them. So we sort of did some cutting and shutting, but they didn't really care about that. Um, because most of it was just in the linkage of the gearbox. Um, but basically I said, it's standard car from the, the front of the gearbox back, standard car. Um, and that there's no, um, welding or cutting needed to make um, so the, uh, the engine fit in the and uh, spoke to them about that, put in that application to modify, um, did a good job of writing it up, making sure there's no mis mistakes, it was very clear and concise, put some photos in there and uh, yeah, sent that off and it came back with basically a list of things that I need to do to get that vehicle passed. So it talked about, I need an emissions test, I need an ID um, inspection, which is where they check the engine number and they're going to need to do that because it's got a different engine in it, so they need to check the engine number. And then I need a vehicle inspection where an inspector puts it on a hoist, goes over it, makes sure that everything's okay. Not only that, I need to do a full vehicle inspection. So that includes, do your brake lights work? Are the seats properly um, held up? Do the seat belts retract? Like, it was a whole vehicle inspection rather than just uh, looking at the specific parts of the modification. So. Um, that's what I had to do. So that was a list of requirements. I was afraid that I might have to do engineering. Thankfully I didn't, which made this whole thing a lot easier and cheaper. Um, so obviously I then did the swap and a couple of weeks ago I went and did my emissions test and I passed that. Basically there's two types of emissions test. One's on a rolling road or a dyno. The other is an idle emissions test. Thankfully I only had to do an idle emissions test, um, which is basically you drive the car up the car's idling, they put six something in the exhaust, um, detects the emissions, and it gives you a readout and says whether you pass or you fail. The reason I think I had to do the idle one is because it's a standard engine um, that's already passed emissions, so in their head, they're just wanting to make sure nothing funky's gone on with the engine, um, that I haven't done something that might make change the emissions, they just want to check that. But if, say, I was gonna do a turbo at the same time, Chances are I would have to do engineering, but I'd also have to do a rolling road dyno uh, emissions test so they can check the emissions through the entire rev range and, and do all that sort of jazz. So um, that was 220 to do that. Just got the uh, emissions tester in there. Hopefully it uh, passes. That's pretty good, is it? Okay. Um, then yesterday I did an ID inspection and they just went over the car and checked all the numbers and uh, that sort of thing. Two of the guys sort of did a double take when the bonnet was up and one of them comes up and goes, uh, nice little sleepy you've got there. Because I had the bottle caps back on it at that stage so I could go do the uh, inspections. And um, then I did the vehicle inspection, which is the one where they put it on the hoist and go over it. And... Uh, yeah, they, they went over it. They didn't actually have any problems at all with the the swap. Uh, I've even got a E36 rack with a Barina steering shaft in it, and they didn't say anything. I think the only issues they have had was one of my side markers wasn't working, and uh, one of the I might need to re-bleed one of the, the rear wheels because it's not putting as much force as the other side, and uh, so. They were the only two real issues they had, but it wasn't enough that they were gonna fail me. It was just, uh, hey, maybe take a look at these sort of things. So I passed that, um, thankfully, and uh, then went around to Motor Reg, got it all registered. 
I also got them to change the year because we've got a 30 year historic rego um, scheme in South Australia and 88 is the year that your car has to be to go on it this year and my car's an 89 or compiled in 89 but the BMW stamp says December 88 so it took three months to get to Australia and so I got them to change that around so I can go on historic rego um, when they did the ID inspection but uh, yeah so it wasn't too much of a, a muck around to do. It wasn't too expensive. I think overall, it's probably cost me about 500 bucks um, to do in you know paying fees and inspection um, bits and pieces and stuff like that. So it's really been pretty cheap. Um, I did it because uh, I don't want to have to have issues in the future. I think it's kind of cool to have something that's fully legal, um, but also modified. Um, and uh, if I ever go do something like ITBs and I get pulled over and defected for it, I really only have to uh, take the ITBs off, put a standard plan, plan them on, and then I can roll through uh, inspection again, rather than, you know, if I did that and the car was registered with an M40, then I'd have to get the whole engine compiled and, and it just becomes a lot, a lot harder to do later down the track. So. Um, I'm pretty happy with it. It really wasn't too difficult to do. You just got to be in the might, right um, frame of mind when you're building the car. Like I was just always very, it needs to be black, it needs to look standard, it needs to have a place. I need to do the charcoal canister and the emissions and that sort of thing. So really wasn't too hard to do. Overall, I'm pretty pleased and uh, we can put, might be able to see that I uh, don't have any wheels on it anymore because I had to give the bottle caps back and uh, now I have to go get new tires for my uh, fake BBSs. So uh, yeah, no, it all went pretty well. And if you're in South Australia and you're gonna be doing the swap, I would give it a crack. I don't know if it cost me anything to do the application to modify, but if it was, it wasn't enough that I remember how much I had to pay. So uh, I'd give it a crack if you're gonna be doing the swap, if you're gonna be staying in A, or even if you're gonna be going turbo, I'd, I would do it and then uh, make it turbo later because once you've got it registered as uh, M50 or M52 or M54 you're set you don't you don't need to go back and honestly it's it's a different atmosphere when you go and get the vehicle inspected um, for this for a modification than it is um, for defects because they look at stuff and they go oh he must have had to do that for the modification and they've okayed the modification so it's not standard, but it looks fine. And the piece of paper says you can do it, I guess. So they let you go through. That's the same why I reckon I got through with the steering shaft. If I tried to do that when the vehicle was defected, I don't think they would have let me through. So one of those things might be worth uh, considering if you're in South Australia or if you're anywhere in the world, really, making sure that it's legal. Um, my insurance didn't actually care. Um, I'm with, with Sh Shannon's and they said as long as the engine doesn't cause a crash they'll still cover it and I had my insurance bumped up once the car was running because of it and they said no it's fine we'll up, up the insurance amount because it's got a different engine and a better engine in it but uh, yeah from a legal standpoint it'll just making life a bit easier so yeah if you've got any questions feel free to leave a comment and I'll see what I can do about answering them.